welcome to the Free To Be Show. I'm so excited to have someone new on the show. As you know, I rarely interview men, but when I do, um, they're really beacons of light in the world. So I'd like to introduce you today to Jonasen Golson, who is the director of Ethical Imperatives, LLC, teaching leaders and professionals how good ethics and good business and the benefits of intellectual diversity. He's a keynote speaker, TEDx presenter, and community rabbi, as well as a repentant hitchhiker. I want to talk more about that. Recovered circumnavigator, former newspaper columnist, and retired high school teacher in St. Louis. He's the author of hundreds of articles applying ancient Rabbina, rabbinic? Rabbinic, rabbinic. rabbinic, thank you, wisdom to the challenges of the modern world and, the, and five books, including Proverbial Beauty, Secrets of Success and Happiness from the Wisdom of the Ages. And um, we'll talk more about um, how, he get to, how he got to be who he is today. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Cordelia. Uh, you've already set the bar pretty, bar pretty high, uh, calling me a beacon of light. I'm going to try and live up to that. <laughs> well, that was just my impression when we first met. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. We met on the Humans First uh, call. So how did you get involved in that community? Uh, that's a good question. Often uh, I find myself with connections and not quite sure how I got there. I think in this case, um, I gave uh, my TED talk last summer in Colorado Springs and I met uh, Heather Younger who shared the stage with me. And Heather is a part of the Humans First community. So I think that was probably the way that I made that connection. That makes sense, yeah, and definitely she's a beacon of light. Um, so, okay, tell me about this, this hitchhiker thing. What, what is that about? I just, uh, yeah. <laughs> for some reason, that's where everybody wants to start. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to the University of California for college, uh, studied English literature, and um, liked it very much. Just the problem with studying English is uh, the problem that Many college students face when they graduate, uh, what am I going to do now? Yeah, yeah. And so I had always wanted to write. I love stories. I love sharing messages. Uh, I love thinking about important ideas. Uh, the problem was, as a 22-year-old college graduate, uh, I really didn't have too many stories of my own. <laughs> and I didn't have any deep ideas that were truly mine. And, uh, and also, I was, I was a, a very reserved, um, quiet, introverted uh, person, uh, still am for the most part. But I recognized that I really needed to do what all the gurus are telling us we need to do now, which was to break out of my comfort zone. I needed to put myself in a situation where I was really going to be challenged, where day to day I wasn't going to know what to expect. Uh, have to put myself in a situation where I had to rely on the mercy of strangers. And, uh, and I hope that by doing that, I would come out of my shell a bit, would learn to deal with the unexpected and the unpredictable, and along the way might learn a few things about the world, about myself, and come away with some stories to tell and some lessons to teach. And, uh, and so that's what I did. Spent about five months hitchhiking uh, around the country. Um, thought I had conquered the travel bug, but uh, quickly found myself going across the Atlantic and backpacking across Europe. Uh, finally ended up in Israel, and that's where uh, my life took a dramatic turn in a direction I never would have anticipated. But uh, one of the lessons that I learned from this is that you, 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 you know, well, you can plan for the unexpected, or okay. you can plan the unexpected. Okay. Uh, you, you. In other words, when we, we get comfortable, we, we give lip service to the need to expand ourselves, but we really don't like it very much. No. And that's the only way we're going to grow, and it's the only way we're going to understand the world we live in, which is necessary for us to understand ourselves. Quite profound, and I find it to be very, very true. You know, it's... Um... I think that was, that was a really good exercise to do straight away after college, because I think that's the problem, right? All the gurus tell us uh, with our midlife crisis, 
you need to get out of your comfort zone. But we spent four decades being in our comfort zone. And you're like, look, I'm going to just solve this problem now. Um, <laughs> I marched to everybody's drum. I got my degree. And now I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. So that's, that's really great. Now, I also have recently met someone who grew up in California. And uh, she was profoundly impacted by a, a visit to Israel when she was in high school. And now that she's married, uh, they've chosen to move their family there. So I'd like, I'm really interested to know what, what happened for you when you showed up in Israel. Uh, I was, I saw myself as a seeker of truth. But, you know, it's very fashionable to be a seeker of truth. Nobody really expects to find truth. And, and if you do, it sounds kind of arrogant. <laughs> I found the truth. Now, who do you think you are? <laughs> uh, and, and I certainly was not expecting to find it in any sort of um, traditional um, religious structure. I figured, you know, maybe um, the Zen masters, maybe on an ashram in, in Nepal. Uh, that was the sort of place where I would have expected to find the truth. And when I got to Israel, um, I, I, I was really just stopping over there for a couple of months. I was going to head off to, uh, to uh, Kenya and Botswana and, and see the rest of the world. But I was burned out. I needed to stop. I needed to slow down. I needed some routine in my life. I thought I would volunteer on a, on a kibbutz, on a collective farm. But there were eight or nine million Americans in Europe that year. The dollar was at an all-time high. And when it got cold in Europe, they headed south. There were no places on, on these kibbutzim, on these collective farms. For the first time in anyone's memory, you couldn't volunteer. Wow. So I needed to find something else to do. And through an unlikely series of events, I ended up in a rabbinic college, in a religious seminary. Wow. Um, which just seemed like a convenient place to, uh, to chill out for a couple of months, to be intellectually <laughs> stimulated. Um, they gave me a bed, they gave me three square meals, they gave me a daily routine, and then I might so learn them some interesting things. I grew up with no knowledge of my Jewish uh, roots at all. Okay, so you were born Jewish. I wasn't sure if you converted yeah, yeah. and changed your name or anything. Okay. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, my, my, my parents named me Jonathan, which is the, uh, okay. which is the Anglo, Anglic form of Yonason, which is the name I use now. Okay. Um, but I knew nothing. I mean, literally nothing about my own heritage, and it was all new. And I really wasn't expecting to change my life, but the dramatic moment happened very quickly for me. I was led into a, into a, a lecture for, uh, about Jewish, history, Jewish uh, philosophy, and when the rabbi walked in, he was Hasidic. He had the big hat and the long coat and the beard and the side locks and the thick glasses, and I just knew that he was going to, to spit dogma at us. He'd have a thick y y Yiddish accent and he'd tell us we're gonna burn in hell if we, we don't listen to him. And instead he sounded like a college professor, which I later found out he was. <laughs> Very welcoming. And he was so articulate and so knowledgeable and so rational. And I just couldn't, I couldn't fit together this image of someone who looked like he just stepped out of the dark ages with someone who sounded a lot smarter than I felt. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's nice to talk about tradition and about culture and about fulfillment, but as a seeker of truth, I was only interested in what was provable, what was logical, what was demonstrable. And I sat in his class for, for two months and, and debated him on every point until eventually I ran out of arguments. I, I, just, I just couldn't refute the things he said. It made so much sense. And then I had to deal with this question, now what? If I'm really a seeker of truth, that means I have to stop when I find it. And if I'm not willing to, then that really makes me kind of a fraud. Mm. 
And so I really had to go through a kind of agonizing reappraisal uh, <laughs> where I was willing to look at a whole theological discipline that never would I have guessed would have anything to offer me. And I made the commitment to, uh, to change the course of my life because I felt this is truth. And this is, this is something to which I need to commit myself. And uh, so I ended, ended up spending nine years in Israel. I met my wife. We had our first two children. I became a rabbi. And from there, I started off on a career in, in Jewish education for 23 years. I love that story. You know, what, what I heard was despite your initial judgment of him, you knew that you were there for the purpose of filling up your heart, even though your mind kept trying to filter, <laughs> your mind kept trying to block, but then your heart prevailed. And, um, and so there it is. You did become the beacon of light. See? <laughs> and it actually works both ways. In other words, the, the heart and the mind um, have a very peculiar relationship. Indeed. That the heart tries to seduce the mind, and the mind tries to seduce the heart. And, and that's why we, you know, in, in, in when I talk about, I use, I use the term intellectual diversity. Um, it's so important that we, that we communicate with people who come from different points of view. I mean, I, I love the optics of this interview. I do too. I, yeah, I was just thinking. <laughs> and you know, to be honest, we're both converts, really, right? Because you, you didn't really grow up practicing Judaism, and I didn't grow up a Muslim either. So, yeah, well, it's, you know, when you come to something by choice, yeah, um, you tend to be a lot more invested Indeed. and take a lot less for granted. Yes. You, you felt compelled to do that. Some people do it for more emotional reasons, some people for more intellectual reasons. But the ability to talk to people and understand people who are different from us gives us the perspective and the breadth that we need to really understand ourselves. And this is the theme of, of my TED talk, that when we put labels on people, what we, what we essentially do is we, we make an excuse not to get to know them. Yeah. Because once I label you, I know who you are. I don't need to, I don't need to think about that anymore. I need to actually probe and find out what do you believe? What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? What's your whole world view? And how do I live in a world? How do I share a world with you where we may believe very different things? And, and those beliefs may not fit together in a nice, convenient way. And yet we can still understand each other. And we can still respect one another's sincerity and authenticity and find common ground that allows us to uh, collaborate rather than be combative. Yeah, I, that's so true. You know, um, like as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm also thinking, right, it makes sense that we would have met in a human's first gathering because that's where our heart set is, right? So people like us hang out with people with a certain heart set. And um, to your point about the mind, um, and this interesting relationship, um, we know when to put the mind at rest and say it's okay not to filter um, and, or directing it to a better way to, um, to proceed. So I, um, I, I'm curious, how did that all point you into the direction of this uh, ethical business? What was it that, um, you know, you've, you had been a school teacher for all those years, and then what, what, where did the shift come from? Well, it was a little bit like uh, the story of graduating from college. Hmm. There's this, this story I love. Uh, I heard it in, in, uh, brought by Napoleon Hill, that when uh, Cortez landed on the New World and his men got off the ship, and they were confronted by armies of natives that didn't want them there and didn't like them and outnumbered them 100 to 1. That Cortez gave the order, burn the ships. 
Now, whatever we may think of Cortez, um, the, the lesson is that often we don't jump until we're pushed. And that's why when, when things go wrong in our lives, wrong, very often those are the most important turning points for us. And for me, uh, I love teaching. I love working with the kids. I love giving young people a sense of structure, moral structure, intellectual structure, um, helping them recognize what are real values, how to balance uh, a 3,000-year-old tradition that, that superficially seems like it's coming from another time and another place with life in the modern world. I love that. But over the course of time, I felt that I wasn't at the top of my game anymore. Um, the students were coming in. They weren't as prepared. They weren't as economic, uh, um, intellectually um, developed or disciplined. Um, and, and I felt that I was getting towards the, the end of my, my career. But this is, what, this is who I was. This is what I did. Well, then my school closed. We are in a small private school. And um, as I like to say, we were too far to the middle. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't right enough for the right and we weren't left enough for the left. And um, our, our support base basically dried up. So there I was, too, too young to retire. Um, not sure what to do with myself. And I wanted to take the essence of Jewish tradition and distill it into a presentation that emphasizes the universal values that are relevant to all of us and put it in a, in a package that would be attractive to professionals, to, to people in, in, the, in the wider world. And so when I tried to distill down all of the principles and ideals of Jewish tradition, I came up with a single soundbite, it was ethical leadership. And it was at that point that I decided to uh, embark on a career in speaking and teaching and teaching adults, training, programs. I think that I can make the case, we can make the case, that ethics underlies everything else. It's a, it's a view of ourselves as having a duty to the world we live in, having a responsibility to others, and especially now, everything that's going on in the world right now, where is the, there is this focus on my rights. And when we focus on our rights, we are going to be butting heads all the time. But if I'm focused on my responsibility, which means I'm looking out for your rights and you're looking out for my rights, now we're always going to be in concert with one another because we're always looking, how can I contribute? How can I watch out for someone else? How can I take responsibility for my contribution to society at large? It applies in our families, it applies in our communities, it applies in politics, it applies in business. And that's the message that I have been trying to uh, articulate since, uh, since I left the classroom and moved into the larger classroom of uh, the professional world. I love that. Well, we're gonna come right back and dive deeper into what that really looks like and what you are actually doing with your business or your speaking business. We'll be right back. Replenish me. When I say that, what comes up for you? And when's the last time that you've done that? And where do you feel that in your body? Well, this is my invitation to you to explore the four steps of my Replenish Me program where women learn how to release, restructure, refresh, and rebirth. Showing up in the world being true to yourself only choosing words that honor your values and only allowing behaviors and people in your life who do the same. Connect with me by reaching out at bit.ly forward slash replenish with love and explore replenish me. And now for tonight's show. So we're back. 
I would like to um, talk more about your business ethics principles and maybe, you know, share through what you spoke of, some of the things you spoke of in your TED Talk. Everything comes down to people. Life is about relationships. And ethics is the mindset of taking into account how my actions are going to affect you, are going to affect the people around me, are going to affect the world I live in. And so to be an ethical leader means to take responsibility for creating a culture in which ethics are valued. And that is particularly relevant to business. Um, I like to say we, we suffer from a, a poisonous misconception that we have to choose between being good and being successful. And there is so much evidence now that ethical companies do better. Ethical companies create environments where employees are more engaged and more passionate and more loyal and suffer less burnout and are committed to one another and committed to the mission of, of the company. It's, I, I was on another podcast and, and I, was, I was articulating this and the host said to me, it's so obvious, why? Like, <laughs> why, why doesn't it happen more? <laughs> right, why didn't we do this all along? <laughs> And it really gets into the, those two parts of our brain, the, the, the amygdala and the frontal lobe are, are just like the head and the, the, head and the heart are in, are, in, are in battled with one another. Well, the, the brain's also embattled with itself because those short-term goals, that immediate gratification, that superficial view of what do I want now is always going to be at odds with our more mature, four-sided, long-term view, what's going to serve my best interest. And, and there are just so many models on this, you know, the classic yin and yang of, uh, of, of um, Asian philosophy, which really is almost identical to the Jewish model, it uses different terminologies, but the yin is, is feminine and it's passive and it's flexible and it's mature and it's internal. And the yang is masculine and active and, and, and fir firm and, and youthful and, and external. And we all, we all have both. In other words, a man has a feminine side, a woman has a masculine side. And, and every one of us is a different balance between the two. And, and good leaders have to know how to shift between these two personas, the one that empowers others by, by letting people um, govern themselves, manage themselves, make mistakes, learn from their mistakes, and then knowing when to shift back and take control and be more authoritarian. And if a leader does that in a way that is sensitive to balancing the needs of the company as a whole, or the community as a whole, with the needs of every individual, then what happens is his people or her people trust them. There's, there's a confidence that the choices are being made thoughtfully, reasonably, rationally. And I may not always like the way things play out, but if there's a culture of ethics, that means there's a culture of trust. And once there's a culture of trust, then I'm willing to accept that what I want may not be what's best for everyone. And ultimately, it may not be what's best for me. Because if, I, if the culture I live in is not a healthy culture, it's not a functional culture, then I'm going to suffer, even if in the short term I get what I want. So you make me think directly about diversity and inclusion, um, since we are, you know, all of a sudden in the United States, have we are reassessing our racial um you know relationships like what we've been doing over the past couple of decades with affirmative action or not acknowledging that it exists so like how 
how can what you do help us to overcome that hurdle? I teach a sophistication of thinking. Um, you know, diversity without inclusion often descends into tribalism. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing right now. Yeah. Um, not, not just the protests, that's obvious. And I'm sorry, not, I, shouldn't, I misspoke. Uh, the protests are fine. The violence that has mutated out of the protests, um, we can all agree that's, that's a problem. But you know, things like tearing down statues, um, it's complicated. But show me a leader who's a perfect person. I recently made a video. I said, my, three of my, my great heroes in life are, are, are Harry Truman, Teddy Roosevelt, and Martin Luther King. <laughs> so Harry Truman, after he died, they found anti-Semitic comments that he had written in his personal di diary. And Teddy Roosevelt, he advocated eugenics for sterilization. And Martin Luther King was a notorious womanizer. We, we don't give successful people or, or people who do, the good, do, do good things a pass because they did good things, but we also don't negate the good things they did because they had checkered lives. Because the truth is we all make mistakes and we're all affected by our environment. And to be able to see Judaism teaches, judge the whole person. Recognize that people are complicated and people have their dark sides and people are products of their environments and they absorb values growing up and they may not easily divest themselves. And if you live in an age where slavery is the norm, how can you judge a person by standards 250 years later say, well, they should have known better. You know, I, I agree with you. It's, it's funny that you say that and like talking about optics, this is going to get, a, this is going to be a really interesting conversation just now. So uh, I went to Mississippi, Biloxi, like a couple of years ago, and I was talking to my Uber driver and we passed this exit where we could go see Jefferson Davis's um, mansion. And I was like, oh, wow, that's here. And he was like, yeah. I was like, oh, it's too bad I don't have enough time to see that. And he was like, because he's a white guy from Florida. He's like, wait, why would you go see that? It's part of American history. And, you know, okay, yeah. So he was the president of, of the Confederacy, but that is part of American history. And um, to be fair, his wife actually <laughs> offered to bring her dressmaker from D.C., who was a black woman, a free black woman. Obviously, that black woman denied. She was like, nope, not going to the South, not happening. But, you know, the point of it is, it's like she was going to still pay her. You understand? And, and although it is a symbol, it could be a symbol of oppression, it's also a symbol of, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly, right? It is what it is. Um, show me a nation that doesn't have any faults, you know? And it just, that's just humanity. It is what it is. In Islam, you know, we do work towards purifying our souls, but we recognize that as you're going through that purification process, you will, what Christians would call backslide a little bit because of the imperfection of your humanness, right? But we never, it's all about the personal responsibility to work towards it. It's never about, um, you know, this is where what you said about looking at the person as a whole, it's the same concept, you know? So it's like, just accept that person for who they are and, you know, in front of you now, and that's it. Um, so once we can just see people for who they are, you know, and, um, and just uh, recognize that as long as we're all working towards being responsible for ourselves and being part of the healing and being part of the solution, that's all we can really do. And so that's what I love about everything you've said and about, you know, um, 
your viewpoint of bringing ethics into business and, you know, encouraging, I guess, on some level, would you say businesses to move towards social entrepreneurism? Um, can you define that for me? Okay. So <laughs> the, a lot of uh, like millennials, even my own company, they will find a cause that their heart is aligned with and um, like a portion of their proceeds will go to that cause. So their whole focus of their business is to make enough m money to stop poverty or to, you know, work for gender equality or something like this. Yeah, well, this is the idea that made Simon Sinek famous, um, and deservedly so. I mean, he took an old idea and he just framed it in a way that everybody gets right away. He's a genius of simplicity in his presentation. Is, I wish I would have thought of um, but you did. You are. That's the whole model of your business. <laughs> well, sure. The idea of find your why. He said, your why, the why of a business has to be something more than let's make money. Otherwise, <laughs> you're just taking up space. Um, and you know, I recently got around to finally reading Jim Collins' classic, Good to Great. And he, he profiles this, these businesses where there was a vision that was more than let's make money. Let's do something extraordinary. Let's create something that serves people. Let's create a, a, a system, a structure, an organization that will give people jobs and allow them to, to, to live lives that they find fulfilling. And it's not either or, it's and. Because when you wake up in the morning, and you know we probably all had jobs at some point in our lives where we dreaded <laughs> going to those jobs. Um, you know, my, my first job as a kid, I was 16 years old, uh, te uh, scooping ice cream. And I hated it. I lost your video. Oh, how, how, how could you hate that? Didn't you, couldn't you like eat the ice cream? I could, but that, that kind of gets old after a while. Um, I was, I was, uh, I got out of school early. So I, I typically worked a shift from one to I think six. And so it was a lot of hours. So I was making at the time what was okay money, but there wasn't much business. I was there by myself and it was just dull. I didn't feel like I was really doing anything of consequence. Mm -hmm. And you know, if employees come to work and they don't feel that they matter, they matter or their job matters or that they're appreciated or that they're recognized or that they have any kind of camaraderie with the people they, they work with, um, that, that creates a toxic environment. When nobody wants to be there and nobody believes in a mission uh, and, and, and everybody's sort of looking around for something better, people aren't gonna be efficient, they're not gonna be productive, uh, they're certainly not gonna be loyal. And so it's simply in the best interest of any company to create a sense of mission and to use that sense of mission, sense of mission to create a culture where everyone feels that they're contributing, that they're recognized and appreciated, and they're, they're empowered and trusted to do a job that matters. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense, you know, being empowered and trusted. I think uh, a lot of what we're seeing is lack of trust in the workplace, you know, these days, a lack of trust in business in general. And um, I'm just wondering to like, to what extent, and I, and I do wanna keep bringing this up, just simply because um, I know at the time of this recording, it's um, you know on the top of everyone's mind, to, to what extent, how can, how can we create trust between um, like black employees and corporations that have been breaking that trust for you know however long 
or even female employees for that matter? Yeah, uh, you know, complicated problems don't have simple solutions. Um, and we're not going to solve the problem of the problems of the world in, uh, <laughs> in the 30 minutes. minutes. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, I remember hearing this a long time ago that the United States Army had done an exceptional job of creating um, a, a kind of a, a equity or parity between the soldiers of different races. And you know, so many of the problems we face are not based questions of color per se, they're questions of culture and economics. Um, there are lots of historical reasons for that. And there are social problems. You're always gonna have racists. It's just, it's just human nature. Um, we don't like it. Most of us have certain biases of our own whether we're aware of them or not. And then again, you've got the, 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 the environmental influences versus the intellectual maturity that are grappling with each other. But what, what I remember learning that the Army did is it had a, a system of remediation where when people, from, people of disadvantaged backgrounds came in, that there were programs to bring them up to speed when I was, I was at the University of California in Davis um, back in the 70s when the Bakke decision was handed down, which was the first Supreme Court decision about affirmative action. And I remember how it, it just kind of muddied the waters by saying, well, you can't have quotas, but you ought to have something. Well, it's true. Yeah. It, I mean, now you've got this problem with Harvard and, and the Asian students. On the one hand, why should I be excluded when I'm qualified to go because I'm not the right race? Hmm. On the other hand, why should, um, how can you not have a, a university culture where you have a diverse mix of students? Because that itself is an educational value. It is, yeah. And on the other hand, you can't admit people who are not equipped to succeed. This is, this is what happened in the early days of affirmative action, is we'll make space for people because of their color, their color, their race. We'll let them in and then they'll fail because they don't have the skills to be able to succeed and we're not helping them with those. So the, there, you know, I, I really, and I'm sorry, I just have to say this. I hate this term systemic racism. Um, I think that if we were a systemically racist society, we wouldn't have had a two term black president. We wouldn't have uh, Supreme Court justices. We wouldn't have black college presidents and, and congressmen and, 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 uh, and entertainers. Um, it doesn't mean there isn't racism, but the system itself is not designed to be racist. The system, however, is not being used to address the problems of racism in an effective way. And that's where we need to be honest with ourselves. It's hard work. When, when something's broken, it's a lot harder to fix it than it is to keep it from breaking in the first place. Yeah, I, I see your point. Um, I mean, Actually, the, the system is designed to protect the interest of white males. <clears throat> and that's an, that's an economic thing. I agree. So that's, is why, that's why people call it systemic racism. But um, I see your point. There, there were some loopholes that allowed, you know, blacks to get through. And, um, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, diminishing any accomplishments of any, you know, black presidents or student body presidents or any of those things. Um, but to be fair, before Jim Crow, there was, you know, <clears throat> there were a, a lot fewer laws to protect the interest of white males. And that's when you saw, that's when we had the most black governors, the most black senators, the most black congressmen. And like, 
to date, we haven't even had those numbers again. But um, I appreciate your weigh in on the topic. And I, I really think though, that the principles that you teach and that you offer businesses are part of the healing and are part of the solution. That's, my, that's what I truly believe in my mind and my heart. And I hope that um, you know, more businesses work with you and can benefit from what it is that you offer. So we'll come back in just a minute. And I want you to talk about that and how people can connect with you, okay? Okay. And we're, we're no Jonas, and we're to the end. And this is the good part where companies that have resonated with our conversation and specifically the things you shared um, can connect with you. So, um, how can they do that? Your website, any programs you have coming up? My website is my name, Jonas and Goldson, uh, which is a little hard to spell, but uh, you can find it, I'm sure, in the, in the uh, show notes. Uh, you know, Goldson.com, and you can also look me up on LinkedIn, where I'm very active. A little bit on the other social media platforms, but LinkedIn's where I spend most of my time. And um, since I started my keynoting business, I've been speaking primarily to professional associations. But certainly, that was that was really a, a business decision. You know, when you've been a teacher for 23 years, um, starting a business is pretty intimidating. <laughs> And it's a, it's a long learning curve. So uh, I, I'm really looking at this point to, to start working with more corporate clients. Because I think that um, it's really what we've been talking about. Uh, a corporate environment is an ideal place to implement an ethical culture. So whether it's I'm actually in the middle, just beginning to design, design an online program which will then eventually lead into a, into a summit, uh, ongoing training, one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm certainly happy to have a conversation to see how I can serve the needs of, of anyone who recognizes that there is room for improvement, and there always is, to be more ethically aware and to create a culture where we, we prosper, we succeed, and we were energized and, and enthusiastic and passionate, not just the people at the top or the decision makers, um, but every, at every strata within an organization uh, to create that sense of team and partnership and empowerment and engagement and purpose. Um, it's, it's, a, it's the ultimate win-win. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely encouraged that corporations would want to, you know, have a better insight on how to move forward. I've, I've already seen like a lot of changes in that realm. So with other consultants in the Humans First community. So, you know, of course, you're one of the best. As I began this conversation with Jonasen, you know, he is a beacon of light and he shared uh, his, his ethics, his principles and his beliefs and ultimate goal for humanity. So we're able to do good business with good ethics and building upon the responsi responsibility towards each other and not just looking out for ourselves. So I want to thank you for being here today. And um I will have your website, which is your name, in the show notes. You make it so easy. I'm sure you're like at the top of the Google search. So, um, <laughs> and super active on LinkedIn. And 
very powerful articles he shares, very profound. So um, do connect with him. And for those of you who have been watching and listening um, and benefited from our conversation today, sharing is caring. So share this with someone else. And if this sounds like um, something you know that a corporation needs or you work for a corporation and they need this, share it. All right. Thank you and good night. It's been a pleasure.